Hey everyone, I want to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study for uh, June the 22nd, 2022. Uh, glad that you're able to tune in today and uh, looking forward to our Bible study today. We are going to be uh, studying the book of Daniel chapter 12. We are going to finally wrap this book up tonight. And uh, so I want to encourage you to get your Bible out, turn with me to Daniel chapter 12, and uh, we're going to take a look at it. I do want to... Um, uh, remind you, if you have any prayer requests, please put those in the reply section so that we could have a record of those, and then we will get uh, uh, those lifted up. I go back every week and kind of look to see if there's any there. There's often not, uh, but um, uh, if you have any, please list them in there. Uh, we do want to remind you um, that... Um, uh, uh, to be praying this week, uh, Hadley Stevens is running her um, uh, 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 special needs camp this week uh, for kids with special needs. And so uh, uh, it's called Wonderfully Made. And so uh, it's been going really good. It's been a lot of fun hearing the kids sing down here and watching them a little bit. And so uh, continue to pray for that. Continue to pray um, as we um, um, are planning our fall season and, and starting to think about that. We still have a lot of summer activities that are coming up. Uh, we just finished up Vacation Bible School, had a good week uh, here with BBS and, and a wonderful time with the kids. Uh, we've got some other events that are coming up. We've got an event coming up in July that's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do a church-wide scavenger hunt, and uh, you could put teams together, and Clarissa is going to be telling you more about this later on, and um, and you can go out. It's just a time to have some fellowship and some fun as a church, and so we're going to be doing that. Uh, we've got a, a number of other things that we're working on and planning. We've got mission trips that are coming up, and, um, um, and so be much in prayer. We have a team that will be leaving out for Madrid very, very soon. We've got a Chicago team that will be going out a little bit later. Of course, we've got a number of our college students, I think eight of them total, that are out serving in various mission capacities. And so I want you to be much in prayer for all of these needs. So before we get into our Bible study, let's go ahead and take a couple of minutes and have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the opportunity we have to gather by Facebook, Father, to uh, uh, study your word, Father. We're so grateful for the freedom that we have to be able to do that, Father. We pray that your Holy Spirit would lead and guide us tonight as we, as we search your word, Father, and try to understand it a little bit more deeply. Father, I pray for these requests that we've already mentioned. You know, uh, Lord, each and every one of them. Lord, you know those that are in our church that are sick and afflicted and struggling, Father. We pray for your hand to be upon them. Lord, we pray for those that uh, um, have uh, decisions to make, Father. We pray that you would lead and guide them. We pray you'd be with all of the various ministry and outreach activities that we have uh, as a church and that we're participating in, Father, our missions projects, our local outreach uh, efforts, Father. I pray that uh, you would watch over and guide each and every one of them, Father. We pray that uh, you might um, uh, speak to our hearts, Lord, and, uh, and guide us. We pray tonight as we look into your word that, Lord, you would would, uh, open our eyes to the truth and, and, and the understanding of your scripture. God, we love you. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, turn uh, with me in your Bibles to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. Now, uh, we're going to close out the book of Daniel tonight. And uh, I I've, I've have a, um, a, a mixed feelings about that. Anytime I come to the end of a book, I really have enjoyed studying the book of Daniel, but I have to tell you that a lot of the, particularly the second half of Daniel, for me is very challenging. Um, I'm not a great student of a Bible prophecy. It's not that I haven't studied it. It's not that I've not read on it, but, but I do believe firmly that a lot of things about Bible prophecy, we have to be careful about being dogmatic about. And what I mean is, is this. There are certain aspects of, of, of Bible prophecy that we can be absolutely sure of. Okay, for instance, first of all, we can be sure that prophecy in and of itself is true 
and that because we see the fulfilled prophecies all the way through the scripture. We see, uh, particularly with the uh, birth and death of Jesus, we see very, very clearly that God predicts those things. We see events back in Israel's history. But we also have to admit there's somewhat of a mystery that goes on with this area, particularly as it goes to the end times. Now, the technical word for that is eschatology, our study of the last things, the end things. Uh, the word eschatology actually has a larger meaning. We normally in the church use it whenever we're talking about our, our end times, you know, um, uh, thoughts. But, but the word really refers to the way that God is working throughout history to accomplish his plans and his purposes. And so we can be absolutely sure that God, in exactly the right way and at the, exactly the right time, is going to bring all of time and all of history to its proper ending and in accordance with his plan. Now, so we can be absolutely sure of that. So we can be sure that Jesus is coming back one of these days. We can be absolutely sure about that. What we have to be careful about is trying to fill in too many blanks because the Bible does leave some of this to somewhat of a mystery. So when I'm studying Daniel, I'm always struggling because um, I'm trying to figure out you know, as everybody does when they study, well, where are we at in this timeline? Well, the reality is we don't know. Um, and we don't always know all of the sequence event of events that are going to play out. So we've got to be, we've got to be careful and be humble in this in to say that while we interpret things, I'm going to interpret some things today for you in what is known as a premillennial um, a view of the, um, uh, of the end times, but other people will disagree. We need to be humble enough to admit that uh, just because you disagree on end times doesn't make you a heretic. Now, if you deny the coming of Jesus, well, that would be a bigger problem. But if, you know, if you're not sure where the rapture places in relation to the tribulation, that's not too big of a deal, to be very honest with you. It's not one we need to divide over or really argue much on. With that said, I'm going to present to you the, 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 this section as best as I can understand it, okay? And uh, so Daniel chapter 12, in the first three verses here, and these are really maybe the, some of the key verses in this particular chapter and in this vision. You'll remember what's happened all the way back in Daniel chapter 10, this terrifying angelic being has come to meet with Daniel and is giving him this message concerning the immediate future of the Jewish people uh, that have been living in exile. And then also he goes on and begins to look further down the corridor of time at events that are still yet even in our day to have occurred. So he's bringing this sort of to a conclusion in chapter 12. So remember, chapter 12, you've got to understand it in relation to chapter 11. And he begins here to talk about the last days. And notice what he says. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people will be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Now, this is a really important verse. This is a verse that kind of lays out, uh, at least in part, our understanding of a coming great time of tribulation on the earth. And you'll notice something here uh, that he says about that. He says, at that time shall arise Michael. Now, Michael is a, um, uh, referred to here as the great prince. Now, we see Dan, or Michael mentioned uh, uh, in several other places. Back in chapter 10, verse 13, we found there that he was mentioned. If you just flip back in your Bible just a few pages there, um, the Bible says, the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes... Now, you'll see that, that that phrase is repeated, that title, chief princes, is referred to both in chapter 10, verse 13, and here in chapter 12. And it literally means the chief ruler. Um, and this is where we get the term and the idea of an archangel. Uh, Arche means first, and then, of course, when applied to an angel, this is the first 
among the angels. And so we'll find that he is mentioned here. He's mentioned um, a couple of other times in the Bible. Uh, for instance, um, uh, or the idea of an archangel, by the way, is mentioned a couple of times in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, with reference to the second coming of Christ. It talks there about, you know, the trumpet shall sound, and it talks about the, the voice of the archangel there. And uh, the only other mention in the Bible, besides these mentions here in Daniel, uh, of, of Michael is over in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 8. Now, when we put all of the biblical picture of Michael together, we can see that, that, that he is one of the, if not the chief angel, one of the chief angels. Now, um, um, it's a little bit hard in the Bible uh, because there's, there's no other mentions of other archangels in Scripture. Although in the Jewish apocryphal writings, for instance, in the book of Enoch, which is apocryphal, it's a non-biblical work among Jewish rabbis, um, they said that there were either four or seven archangels. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to translate and see exactly which one they meant there, um, but there might have been a plurality of archangels. Um, in, in, the, uh, in a lot of the apocryphal li literature that was written between the Babylonian exile and the uh, book of Matthew, um, a lot of this stuff was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. For instance, there's a very famous war scroll that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in, the, in that scroll, Michael is presented there as the guardian angel of the nation of Israel. And that actually fits in with a biblical picture because every time we see Michael, he's kind of warring on behalf of the nation of Israel. But what's interesting here is... Uh, Michael arises, and yet the people still go through a very hard and difficult time. And it, it, it really, to be honest with you, in verse 12, it's hard to understand whether or not Michael is protecting the Jewish people, or he's the one that's actually bringing about some of their suffering and their pain. And, um, and uh, it could be either one if you read the verses. Now, he mentions that there should be a time of trouble, we would translate that as, as tribulation, such as never has been since there was a nation uh, till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. He's talking here about this enormous... Um, uh, um, uh, period of unprecedented suffering for the Jewish people. Now, we look back through history, and the Jewish people have endured um, more hardship than perhaps any other group of people on the face of the earth. We think about the Holocaust. We think about the challenges that they had throughout the Middle Ages, and, and of course, during the captivity in Babylon, and, and even today, uh, there's so much strife and so much trouble. And yet the Bible says there is coming a day when the nation of Israel is going to have an even greater period of tribulation, so great that it's really going to be unprecedented. And Michael is going to be somehow involved in this. Um, now, it could be that Michael is acting as a restraining force. Some Bible uh, 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 students and, and teachers will say that Michael is restraining this evil, that, that the Antichrist and the world system in those end days would be so adamant that they would try to destroy all of the Jewish people. There's another view that God is disciplining the children of Israel in the tribulation period, and therefore Michael is actually inflicting and bringing about some of this suffering in order to lead the people to repentance. And really, the chief thing that I want you to remember is not just the suffering of the Jewish people during the tribulation, but also their deliverance. Notice what he says, but at that time your people shall be delivered. 
everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. In other words, he's saying that during this period of the tribulation, and this is consistent with what we understand in the book of Revelation, that there is going to be a great outpouring of the gospel and of salvation among the Jewish people. Now, you think about that when we go back into the Old, into the New Testament and we look at the early uh, preaching of the church. You'll remember that when Paul went from town to town and other apostles, they would preach in the Jewish synagogues. Um, and and they're, they're kind of thinking about this. Their strategy was to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. In other words, we're going to offer the salvation, we're going to offer it to the Jews, and then if they reject it, we're going to turn over and offer it to the Gentiles. And that seems to have been the predominant thing. And during this church period, the predominant number of people that are coming into the faith and coming into the kingdom of God are Gentiles. Now there's a few Jews here and there, and, and there is a movement among the Jewish people, um, and, but it's not been in, in mass. He's saying here that in the tribulation period, one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be this incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit and work among the Jewish people to bring them to salvation. And it's very clear there when he uses that uh, phrase, uh, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book, they're going to come to faith in Christ. Now remember this. There's sometimes a confusion in the evangelical church, and they all sometimes certain Christians will almost seem to believe that there are two plans of salvation in the Bible, a plan for the Jewish people and a plan for Gentiles. That is not true. God has one plan of salvation for both Jew and Gentile, and it's by faith in Christ. Okay, so listen, apart from Jesus, there is no salvation. A person cannot earn their way to heaven uh, through Christian acts of sacraments, nor through the keeping of the law. And so when we look at the Jewish people, if they're going to come to faith in Christ, if they're going to go to heaven when we die, if they're going to be reconciled to God, they must come through Jesus. And he's saying here that there is going to be a period of time somewhere out in the future where as a result of this great period of tribulation, that there's going to be a massive outpouring of, of salvation among the Jewish people. Now, we don't see that here in our day and age. Um, as much as we love and respect the nation of Israel and recognize that God has a special plan for that nation, today, uh, to be very frank with you, they're an opponent to the gospel. Uh, if you try to preach the gospel in Israel, uh, out on the streets, uh, you can get in a lot of trouble for that. Uh, they are, I won't say that they are, are equally, um, uh, you know, they don't persecute Christians equally with a lot of the Muslim countries, but it's not very far off. But there will be a day when they are calling to come to faith. And that's what he's talking about here. And uh, there'll be a day when, when God is going to do that. And if you go over like Revelation, Romans chapter 9, uh, he talks about, Paul talks about there'll be a day when, when all of Israel will come in, when, 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 when the Jewish people are going to come back and respond to the gospel and recognize Jesus as their Messiah. But notice what he says there. Um, he, he talks about um, um, uh, the, the fact that there's going to be this great deliverance. Um, in verse 2, he says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so here he's talking about at the very end of the time, there's going to be this great resurrection and, uh, and there's going to be this great judgment scene that we see at the end of the book of Revelation where everybody's going to have to stand before God. Now, as believers, we know that our uh, destiny because of our relationship with Christ has been sealed. Uh, what we're going to be judged on is our works. How have we lived out the Christian faith? It's not a judgment of life or death, but rather a judgment of rewards. The New Testament refers to this as the great white throne judgment. But in Revelation chapter uh, 20, uh, let's go over there real quick, over Revelation chapter 20. Uh, and in verse 11, um, notice what happens here. 
Now, this is a period after the millennial period. Now, let me kind of try to help you understand what I'm talking about here. And again, I'm going to present to you the, the pattern of biblical prophecy as best as I can understand it. There is going to be a day when uh, Jesus, uh, or there's going to be a period sometime in the future of great tribulation. Let's start there. Now, some people believe that there will be a rapture of the church just prior to the tribulation. Some people believe that that, tri that rapture might take place in the middle of the tribulation. Others believe that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the rapture of the church and the second coming are the same event. And so that uh, it, it, if you look at that, some people believe, if you believe that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation, then the church will never have to undergo this great time of trouble. Uh, the church will be taken up, and then they will return with Christ at his second coming. Okay? That's the, that's the pre-tribulational uh, rapture of the church. Some people say, no, the church is going to have to undergo the first half of that, that first three and a half years, and get there, and then they'll be taken out, okay? Others believe, and I tend to lean towards this view, that the church will have to go through tribulation, and that the return of Christ and the tribulation, or, and, and, and the, the rapture that some people refer to, are the same event at the end of that period. And Christ comes back at that moment and establishes a thousand-year reign. Now, I'm going to be free to admit to you, I could be dead wrong about those two events being the same. I kind of hope that the first one is true. I'm hoping that there'll be a rapture of the church that will be taken out, and then uh, we'll wait seven years and then come back with Jesus. That's the ideal. But I kind of agree with Billy Graham, uh, who said that, you know, let's be prepared for both. I hope for this one, but I'd be prepared to go through it if I were you. And I think that's a pretty good uh, opinion. Um, people ask me, well, when will Christ return? Well, the Bible makes that very clear that he will not return until the gospel has been preached to every tribe, nation, and tongue. So rather than trying to figure out world events, let's just look at where we are in the scope of world evangelism. That's a better uh, gauge for us about when he'll come back. So, so there'll be a period of tribulation. Christ will return, establish his reign. In Revelation chapter 20, the first half of the, or first third of this uh, um, uh, uh, chapter is about that millennial period, that thousand year reign where Christ is going to rule physically and visibly here on earth. Uh, that's going to entail the defeat of Satan as well and the judgment before the great white throne. So notice what he says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You see how that kind of parallels with Daniel chapter 12, verse 2? And many of those who sleep in the dust of their shall awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is the great judgment uh, of God. And uh, it's a reminder to us that believers, when we die, our soul goes on to be with Jesus in heaven, to be absent from the body, the Bible says, to be present with the Lord. But our body then is waiting in the grave for the resurrection. And one of these days we will be resurrected. Now, you'll notice what he says in verse 4. But you, Daniel... Shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on the bank of the stream, on that bank of the stream. In other words, it's kind of like two angels standing on the banks of the Tigris River. And notice what happens. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, now we have this vision 
of a person who is, in my mind, I see him as being kind of dressed in linen, kind of hovering above the waters there. And there's a question asked. Now, the identity is, who is this man in linen? I believe that it's Jesus. I believe that this is a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus here. And notice what he announced, what, what the question is. How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. Now, I want you to notice something here. Uh, here Jesus is almost outlining here for us a course of events that are going to come up. Daniel says uh, to, to Jesus, I don't really understand what this is all about. I'm, I don't understand everything you're telling me. Now, that's good news for us, and that's a reminder to be humble. If Daniel, who received the vision and wrote the book, didn't understand all of this, then what chances we are going to? Okay, you understand what I mean? We've got to be humble about this. We've got to admit that some of this is going to be very complicated. But Jesus then lays it out. Um, he says, uh, uh, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the end of the time. In other words, the, Jesus is saying this plan of events is guaranteed. In other words, you might think of this as a, a great expression of the sovereignty of God, where Jesus is saying, listen, I've already determined how the future is going to play out. I've already discernment, determined all of how this is going to lay out. And so then he says, from the time that the, he says, um, many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And I think this is a, an expression of what's happening in the church age. That while the gospel is being preached, many are coming and purifying themselves. It, all around the world today, as many problems as we have in the world today, the good news is that Jesus is still on the throne, the gospel is still being preached, people are still coming to Christ every single day in the world. All right, The kingdom is still advancing. But in the midst of that, there are wicked people who are still going to be wicked, and they're still going to do evil things. And so then he says, and from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the uh, uh, abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end. And you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. Now, he says that and gives us a little clue about the timing here. He talks about that this great time of tribulation will not take place until the, this abomination that happens, this abomination that causes desolation. Now, again, in the Old Testament, we do have a parallel of this. Remember, early in the book of Daniel, we talked about how Antiochus came in during uh, the uh, Persian period and uh, uh, corrupted the temple by the offering of pagan sacrifices in the holy place and all of these kind of things. And some scholars think that that's the time he's talking about. But it seems to me he's looking down the future, and that event that happened in history is a, is a preview of something that's going to happen later down in the course of history with another greater abomination of desolation. I don't want to speculate on what that may be. Uh, personally, I think it involves the rebuilding of the temple and some type of idolatry that's going to be going on there, uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, uh, by the Antichrist there. But the idea here is when the Antichrist abom abolishes worship, that this is a trigger point. This is a moment when, when um, uh, 
uh, th that this, this period of time is going to outline. Now, we really don't know what the difference is between the 1,290 days and the 1,335 days. There's a lot of speculation about that. There's no good resolution for what he means there, other than Jesus is simply saying to us, I've got this all worked out. I've got a plan. And continue to trust me. I love what he says to Daniel to close your book. But go your way till the end. And you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. What he's saying to Daniel is, Daniel, don't be too shook up about all this. You've seen all of these world events. You've seen all of this stuff that's going on around you. Don't get too shook up about it. Because remember, I'm still in control, Jesus is saying, and I'm going to put you in the proper place at the proper time. Well, that brings us to the end of the book of Daniel. Uh, we will pick up next week with something else. I haven't quite decided exactly where we're going next, but uh, you can hold your breath in, in anticipation of an exciting new Bible study series starting up next Wednesday night. Thank you for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you this Sunday.